TTHM presents an edutainment podcast with Jason Ackerman, one click at a time. Hi, this is Jason over here in the studio. We're sitting down with one of my favorite clients and longtime friend, Ian Servany from Telephone Town Hall Meeting, also known as TTHM talk about the incredible work he and his team are doing over there. Ian, thanks a ton for bringing your team, being here with us. I start by sharing with me a little bit about the history of TTHM. Yeah, TTHM started as Telephone Town Hall Meeting before we decided that the word telephone was not a brand that we wanted to be associated with. So no, nobody owns telephones anymore. So uh, we went to TTHM and uh, kind of expanded our offerings. We used to just do teletown halls when we were telephone town hall meeting, and that would be big dial outs to a big audience, typically for a member of Congress because the technology was built specifically to connect members of Congress with constituents back home. And then we just kept finding new markets for it, municipalities, uh, labor unions, counties, government agencies, and, and now a lot of healthcare providers. But then we also expanded beyond just telephone calls into peer-to-peer and app-to-peer texting and um, a whole host of services along the way and things that we still do like robocalls. We even got back in direct mail. So we, we went to TTHM because telephone town hall meeting was way too specific for what we do now, which is a little bit of everything. Um, as far as a, a little bit of every, every mass, mass outreach, we, we offer a service. My name's Ian Servany. I'm the operations director at telephone town hall meeting, or TTHM. I started in 2010 when we left our office downtown where we worked almost exclusively in political communications and decided to work from home. Um, My man Preston Underwood, who's our operations manager, he started uh, just a year later in 2011, started taking on some of our screener collector roles, but now he manages uh, the majority of our data and event setup. And then of course, Allison Court here started in 2012. And what's your title now, Allison? I just call you when I need a problem solved, so. Yes, problem solver extraordinaire. (laughs) Um, I think I'm officially the production manager. Yes, I like that term. Yes. Allison Court, our production manager. And this podcast brought to you by coffee. Delicious. Mm. Any coffee. Tell us a little bit about the early days with you and your dad, Kurt Servany. Uh, Kurt uh, started us all off down uh, across the street from the Capitol building in Denver, and I worked with him there. And back then, I just ran data and did copywriting for political advertising. And I did a little bit of organization for political campaigns. And then Kurt was the owner of that company as well. And it had several different iterations. But we decided we didn't want to keep paying rent across the street from the Capitol downtown. And this was in 2009. So I can't even imagine what that office would have cost us now, the massive office space we had down there. But we decided we wanted to work from home, cut down our overhead, and kind of explore some new technologies. And so that was a decision he made. And I, I a young son at the time, so I wanted to be working from home, not so much in the living room of my two-bedroom apartment, but that's where we started, and it was there were some lean years at first, but we've really grown well, and so it's been a good partnership for myself and my father, kind of him leading our sales team, and then myself leading our operations team. One thing I love about Kurt and the company is that it really is all family. Everybody is related to somebody. That makes it sound a little weird and backwards, but uh, <laughs> everybody really is family. Um, and it's funny when pe- new people come in, they're like, now how, who is she related to? How is she related? And, I mean, like Ian was saying, Preston started in the beginning. He's He's been family the whole time, and it's just really neat how it's always somebody who knows somebody who brings them in. And, yeah. Yeah, and, and Preston and I have been friends since high school. Uh, we reconnected uh, around the 10-year reunion of our high school graduation year 2000. I was like, hey man, you need a job. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and obviously he's invaluable and yeah, very much family oriented. I mean, and everybody that we hire that's not family is friends. So most of our operators are friends of myself or Allison or Preston or all of us or friends of Kurt's or so. I mean, I think Something that Kurt and I have always put a premium on is working with people we can trust. I'd rather work with somebody I can trust and pay them more and care more about them than pay somebody and work with somebody I don't trust and have to, I don't know, just worry about their commitment to to the company and the commitment to our, our shared success. And I don't ever have to worry about that with this company. It's a real blessing. Yeah, they all come in and become a part of the family. So what was the first new technology TTHM introduced as you transitioned away from the telephone? 
You know, it'd be something we don't even use anymore, which would be ringless voicemail drops, where your phone doesn't even ring, you just have a voicemail pop up, which all of us in mass communications thought was really cool at the time because there were a lot of studies that came out saying people hate it when their phone rings. If you can just deliver them a message, they'll like it. Turns out when the phone doesn't ring and they just get a voicemail from somebody, they're a little creeped out. So that's uh, not, not only did carriers stop delivering those, but of course we, we stopped offering them. But I mean, we, we also offered a lot of old technologies like voice broadcast and direct mail that we've always done. I'd say the most successful new technology we offer is peer-to-peer -peer slash app-to-peer texting, um, where we have our operators sending a text one at a time to targeted recipients, and then we, we're all about compliance, because obviously carriers get complaints when people send too many texts or negative texts or unwanted texts, so a lot of what we do is make sure that our clients are getting their texts delivered by sending them intelligently and making sure they're sending them compliantly. So peer-to-peer -peer texting, I think, is probably our most powerful tool outside of teletown halls. Can you give us some examples of your peer-to-peer -peer texting technology being used outside of that political spectrum? We used peer-to-peer -peer texts at first just to notify people of upcoming teletown halls and to ask them to opt in because we can't call somebody, cold call somebody on their mobile phone for a teletown hall event, but we can text them and ask them, would you like to be a part of this event? If so, reply yes, and we'll call you the time of the event, and you can join this live virtual forum with your member of Congress, with your union leaders, with, you know, municipal leaders, or uh, with your health care providers. So I think we used it most for that, and we still use it a lot for that. So political campaigns for sure, but I think the, the better use of it is, you know, kind of more urgent communication that people want. You know, I think of labor a lot when we talk about communications people want to be getting as part of a union, if they're part of an advocacy organization, you know. I think those are our most successful outreach as far as leveraging text alerts. Yeah, and I, I think that a lot of text regulation has fallen on the heads of the carriers themselves, and that's a lot of what we deal with as a company is compliance with, compliance with the carriers because the federal government is not about to step in between mobile carriers and their customers and start mandating things about what can be sent and tell them, all right, now you have to go by these protocols and block this traffic. The carriers are doing that themselves, so if they're sending you too many texts, you can definitely let them know and they'll, and they'll stop. Remember this, and this is a pro tip. If you ever get a text you don't want, reply STOP, all caps. If you do not get an opt-out message, that message sender is not complying with regulations on texting. And if they don't take you off their list, they're going against texting regulations at the federal level. And you are absolutely welcome to uh, notify the federal government through the FCC that they've been doing that, and they will come down on them. So. Oh, and I, yeah, I can imagine they come down on that pretty hard. Yeah, uh, political campaigns do not want to get hit mid-campaign with a bunch of complaints to the carriers because, frankly, the, the carriers are just not going to deliver that type of traffic anymore. Political campaigns that don't register their campaign with mobile carriers now will simply not have their messages delivered. And that's a lot of what I've been working with on the 10 DLC compliance, which is industry-guided. They want to be the keepers of the content, and they want to be able to decide what goes through. And to do that, they're having people register their text campaigns in advance, and then they're going through some other compliance protocols, like making sure you manage your opt-outs. If someone replies stop, you better get them off that list post-haste. Otherwise, the carriers are going to start getting complaints from their customers, and then they're going to ax your, your messages the next time you try and send them. So what is 10DLC? What does that stand for? 10-digit long code. 10-digit ten, ten long code. So they basically assign a 10-digit code to your texting campaign and use it to vet it through their mobile systems. So the mobile carriers are, are saying, you're going to register with this private company effectively. They're going to use that to vet your messaging through all of their, you know, all the various carrier systems. And then individual carriers are going to add additional levels of compliance based on their particular wishes within that carrier, which is why it's important to use a good text vendor, because otherwise they're just sending your messages out to the ether and sending you an invoice, and that's not what you want. You want, you want to make sure your messages get delivered. In yeah. theory, they're doing it for what you were saying, that mm -hmm. we're, we're just getting too many text messages, so they're trying to remove everyone who has bad messaging that doesn't isn't trying to get through with you know with anything that would help you i get texts all the time it's like lose 10 pounds by tuesday they're trying to get rid of all of those people and make sure that it's a registered it's an actual organization sending 
you important information rather than just spam. Absolutely, and it's been a boon for us because we're, we see those spammers and scammers as being damaging to our industry, which is compliant, wanted mass messaging. So what's the internal process for that? I mean, you guys don't have just like a bunch of people sitting on their iPhones in the corner shooting out texts. When not, far off. not far off. Not far uh, off. In fact, uh, so what we do have is we have individual operators clicking to send using an app each message one at a time, and that's what makes it compliant and legal. Congress has still allowed itself the latitude to do what we call a blast send, where they're just having a system blast out all of these texts. So they've given themselves the latitude to do that, but your average company or, or organization or even a city can't do that. They have to send them out peer-to-peer -peer is what it's called, where you have an individual sending to another individual, or in this case, app-to-peer, -peer, where an individual is using an app to send individual texts to each targeted recipient. Um, and then managing, I think a big part of what our team does beyond that is managing do not contact requests, anybody who wants to be taken off. There's an automated system-wide aspect of that so we don't have to, so that you know we're not always relying on our staff to do it. So there's an automatic removal process, but then we go through and make sure that if anybody's asked and to be removed in a strange way, we get them out of there too. And then we maintain that opt-out list for each of our clients in perpetuity so that even if they go back, get a new list from their list vendor, get a new list from our list vendor, and start texting again, those people that have been have asked to be opted out for that client are gonna be scrubbed out of that new list as well so that we ensure that we're, again, remaining compliant. And the, the last thing you want is for them to be reaching out to their carrier and saying, I got this unwanted text message. So that's didn't used to be a problem. That's why scammers and spammers have had so much you know, room to operate, but that's not gonna be the case by the end of this year. So are these texts from like private 10 digit numbers or is it those weird five digit codes that I sometimes see? That's one of the things that's gonna change with 10 DLC, a concurrent uh, compliance mechanism they're using is gonna allow us to send all of the messages from a single number. In the past, what we've done is we have a bunch of numbers that we can source from to use this as effectively text ID. It's coming from this phone number, but it's just a large set and we base it on zip code. So it might come from any of these 100 phone numbers in this zip code. And that's, um, that, again, this is, it, I think that's a, a relic of the origins of peer to peer and A to P texting that's going to be going away soon as we move towards, you know, a more standardized industry. Some of them are great though. We made them really personal last year. One of my favorites was where we were able to, by zip code, just text people a list of their voting drop off locations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was like, hey, we know that you're in this area. You can take your ballot into these five locations. And it was really neat to be able to do that, to geolocate them and to provide that information. And we, that was a huge, really lots of positive responses to that. And like Ian said, we get a lot of positive responses to the, the town halls in the town. I wish my town would do one mm -hmm. and text me and say, hey, they're talking about this, want to join? Absolutely. Or unions. I do a lot of work with the unions and they even, during their town hall calls, they run a poll. We're asking people to opt in for text message updates and they keep everybody up to date with bargaining and, you know, get out the vote, all of the, the, um, all of the walkouts. What are they called? Oh, can we just use walkouts because I can't remember the real term? Yeah. They keep everybody up to date about everything, so it's good. You do get a lot of positive responses, but... Uh, are all of those applications peer-to-peer -peer texting? Yeah, peer-to-peer, -peer, and more specifically, they're app-to-peer, -peer, because a peer-to-peer -peer would be me sending you a text. But app-to-peer -peer is I'm sending you a text using this app that auto-populates with your name and with the message we're sending, your name and phone number and the message we're sending. But someone still has to... Click it and send it. Yep. Yeah. But you still do those one by one. One by one. One by one by one. So how big is an average text campaign? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. And they range from like, you know, a, a couple thousand to a hundred thousand, frankly. It's a lot of clicks. A lot of clicks. Yeah. It is a lot of clicks. Yeah. During the, during, when, when we're working for a really big political campaign, it's the, the, you know, the very end of political season, we've got, you know, sometimes 10 plus operators all working on a campaign sending texts. What about other companies in your field? Do, do they usually have the sort of manpower it takes to run these campaigns? No, typically not. And I think our staff, and we try to remind ourselves and, and our clients of this all the time, I think our staff is really the strength of our company, our operations crew, because they all work remotely. We don't have a central office. Everybody's working from home. And we've just taught them how to do all of the things they do, whether it be uh, screening or collecting on a teletown hall. Some of our operators, so like Allison, have moved up to moderating teletown halls or whether they're sending texts. And because we pay them well enough to be compensated for that time well, 
whether it be sending text, which they get paid for by the click, or whether they be working for an hour for us where they get paid more than double the minimum wage, they're invested in, 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 in the campaign being a success, whether it's a teletown hall or a text alert or a robocall or direct mail, it doesn't matter. We're, we're getting a good product out the other side. So none of our competitors have the manpower we do as far as just a bunch of people sitting at home in 10 different states sending texts or managing the back end of a teletown hall. And that makes us compliant. And mm -hmm. so you have the best chance of getting through and the best chance of not getting marked as spam or scam. Mm -hmm. and, and then your message will get through and not just the first time, but then the second time you want to send again and say, hey, here's another reminder. You haven't voted yet. Go drop off your ballot. Your message will get delivered um, instead of the carrier holding it up because they can tell when you blast out. Mm -hmm. They're, because the carrier is receiving those texts at either a rate where it's obvious you're all sending them click by click, or a rate where it's obvious that you've, and I'm not going to accuse any of our competitors of this, that would be untoward, and I have zero proof that anybody else is doing it any other way than the most compliant way possible, which is how we do it, but it would be theoretically possible to write a simple script on your computer that just clicked a button and then walk away from your computer. We don't do that, but I wonder who might be. Well, hey guys, thanks for coming, telling us about TTHM, all the amazing things you guys are doing over there. We'll be back with a more in-depth look at TTHM and their plans in the next episode. Thank you, Ian, Allison, Preston. Looking forward to chatting more soon. Are you actually working over there, Preston? Yeah, I got text. Oh, see, there you go. <laughs> Literally happening right here. Preston is over at another desk sending texts compliantly right now. One click at a time. Totally compliant. One <laughs> click at a time. One click at a time.